Good morning. Welcome to um, this second day of the third FinTech conference organized by um, the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia and specifically um, uh, Jalapa, who did a fantastic uh, job putting these panels together. I think everybody would agree yesterday was um, fantastic. My name is uh, Bob Hunt, and I am the Associate Director of the Consumer Finance Institute here at the Philadelphia Fed. Um, and that is an applied research group that focuses naturally on consumer credit and uh, consumer payments. And we have, um, uh, we are a continuation of a investment by this bank over two or three decades um, in these areas because obviously we feel um, that it's um, very important. So I have been tasked today um, to take us through all of the mathematical proofs of Professor Kirilenko's paper uh, yesterday. Um, actually, not really. Um, if we do get some more Bitcoin miners, we might be able to get that clock to move, but uh, uh, apparently that's a, an empty, mar an empty uh, part of the chain. Um, so yesterday we had a panel that was primarily about um, certain mechanical aspects of the blockchain and various ways in which some of the, um, the private um, digital currencies that operate on, on the blockchain work, and, and that was very fascinating. But today we want to take a step backwards and ask some more questions about first principles, um, really about what money means in a digital age, um, what does um, uh, fiat money mean, what does private money mean, um, and what are the policy issues uh, that are related to that. And um, President Evans um, really teed up that conversation um, very well yesterday, but now we're going to get in, uh, into this in much more detail. And we have a very special panel with us today because we have um, uh, a group of folks who um, do academic research in this area, but also who have a lot of experience in the um, policy process uh, related to central banking and, and payments. So they have their hands on both sides of this, um, which I think is really important to have a conversation um, probably in the decade in which um, these currencies either um, take off or they, or they don't. So the way we're going to organize this is um, um, our, the bios are all in the um, uh, pamphlet here, so you can look up people's um, bios. But we're going to start with Tim Lane. Uh, with the Bank of Canada, who's going to present his perspectives on um, digital currencies. He'll speak for about 10 or 12 minutes. And then I'm going to allow each of the panelists in the order on the agenda to call out one aspect of um, Tim's arguments and essentially argue about whether they agree or disagree with those. So that'll be about five to seven minutes each. Well, then we're going to go popcorn style um, with the panelists to get a conversation going about... Um, um, a variety of the issues, and then at the end, we'll open up for um, some questions from the audience. So um, without any more interruption, let me um, ask Tim to come up and speak. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Robert. And uh, I mean, and also thank you very much to the organizers for putting on this event and for inviting me. It, it's a very interesting area, very, very uh, I think, exciting area now. It's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's really about understanding how technology is already changing our world. And, uh, and uh, from a point of view of central banks, it's about how uh, the advances in technology that we're seeing could uh, ha affect our mandate and our, our, our ability to perform our mandate, which is to provide our citizens with means of payment that they can use with confidence. And that means both uh, sort of the mechanics of how they're provided, the security and, and the safety of those things, but also the stability of their purchasing power, which is something we deliver with monetary policy. And so we're thinking about all those aspects when we think about this sort of digital, uh, this, this issue of digital currency. Now, the Bank of Canada, we've been, uh, uh, for the last five or six years, been doing research on um, on, on the, uh, basically the question of, uh, you know, in this world where various private operators are 
developing uh, uh, developing uh, digital currencies or things that aspire to be digital currencies. Um, you know, is this something central banks should be trying to do? I mean, is there a way that we should be that we could actually create a digital equivalent of, of the humble banknote, something that would perform some of the same functions as that? And, uh, but would still be transferable uh, through digital means and through, uh, and, and through online transactions. And, um, and, and I guess the question arises, well, why would we want to do that? And really, I think the conclusion when we think about it is that we, we can't really see a compelling reason for doing it under current circumstances, but we can plausibly see the world changing in a way that could actually uh, make it uh, 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 something we'd want to consider uh, very seriously and in fact be ready to do if those circumstances arose. So, I mean, here we're really thinking about, about a couple of alternative scenarios and actually they're not mutually exclusive, but, they're, but they're, they're kind of distinct in the things that are driving them. And one of them is the, uh, is a scenario where, uh, where you have uh, private digital currencies of some, some description that start to get a major footprint in the economy and they, they start to be widely used for transactions. And, then at that point, the question is, well, are they going to actually provide the functions of money in, in, a, in a way that, uh, that, that is consistent with the mandate of central banks that I, that I referred to? And uh, um, I guess, for example, you can imagine a world where you have multiple providers of digital currencies. And, and uh, uh, in that case, you'd be in a little bit, a world a little bit reminiscent of a historical context where, uh, where private um, uh, banks were issuing banknotes, and uh, and where you know anybody, any merchant had to think, well, okay, I'm, this is one from the uh, from the first uh, uh, Wilmington Bank. Uh, I wonder if they're uh, you know what are they tra trading at par this week, and uh, and that sort of thing. And you have this whole problem of kind of of having to get a lot of information about what it is you're accepting in transactions, and and of course uh, central banks basically created a public monopoly uh, on on banknotes, and that in a sense. Um, created a common standard, brought the trust of a public institution behind it, and, um, and, and gave the public a, a, basically a coordinating, coordinating mechanism for a, around one uh, means of payment and, and other, others that were kind of built on that. And so that's, uh, that, that's of course, one variant of, the, of, of, of a scenario where uh, private cryptocurrencies could actually create a world where we would see a need to, to create a public Digital currency, but but I guess another one is um, is, is a scenario which uh, is currently being looked at pretty closely in Sweden because it's actually happening there, and that's actually for much lower tech reasons. It's the fact that uh, the banknotes are actually um, d dwindling in their daily use to the point where you're actually reaching a tipping point where you've got not only the dwindling use by by uh, the members of the public, but also you've got uh, merchants increasingly. Uh, refusing to accept banknotes, and you've got, um, and you've got uh, banks increasingly not offering services to process banknotes. And the thing is, once you get to that point, then you start to worry that people who want to use banknotes are actually not able to do that. And we know that there are a number of reasons that pe people like banknotes. Um, uh, you know, we've had a, a lot of research at the Bank of Canada on means of payment and trying to get a sense of why people use banknotes. But I mean, some of it is the safety, some of it's the degree of privacy you get from uh, paying with cash. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little more because it's, it is a two-edged sword. Um, the, uh, one, of them is the, uh, uh, one of them is the sort of resilience, the fact that if the system goes down or the bank's closed or whatever, you can still use, um, you can still use cash to pay for things. Um, it's the fact that anybody can use it. You don't have to have a bank account. If you're new to the country, you can uh, change your, your foreign money into domestic money. If you're, if you're homeless, uh, you can accept donations in cash and, and you don't have to have a bank account to process it and so on. So there are a number of reasons that people like banknotes. And the question is, well, would we, would we miss them if we didn't have them? I mean, if, if they did sort of go out of circulation, of course there are things we can do to delay the point at which we, we start to see them disappearing from daily use. But a, a question would be if, if we created a digital form of banknote, would that actually um, uh, create some benefit to the public? And in, in fact, could it recreate some of the benefits that we think we're providing 
when we uh, are responsible for providing cash. So those are, those are questions we've been mulling over and uh, we have quite a lot of research. In fact, uh, interesting, Rod, uh, Garrett is here and he's been uh, with us for, uh, for, for, for some time as a visiting scholar now back in, back in Santa Barbara, but basically uh, uh, contributed quite a lot to our thinking about this. Uh, but but uh, you know, we've been thinking about, uh, about a number of different aspects of these questions and, and it really, I think, is particularly interesting because it, it, it combines quite a lot of different aspects, the technological, the legal, the, um, the uh, sort of financial and economic aspects, um, and, uh, uh, and, and more broadly sort of the, the governance, the role of the central bank versus the role of the private sector in, in the financial system. And so, uh, you know, we have research that's been showing up on our website, but we're actually now at a bit of an inflection point where we're kind of moving uh, from, from research to uh, something that feels a lot more, more like contingency planning because we're aware that the world can change very quickly. And although we don't think that Bitcoin is the money of the future, we think that it's got too many flaws in its design to be that. But at the same time, uh, the world could change in a way that would very rapidly uh, uh, transform the way that people pay for things. And, uh, and uh, if we start to think about what we might do in reaction to that, uh, when that starts to become evident, then that's going to be too late. Uh, we're just going to have to accept the way the world evolves. And so we really need to, we need to, uh, to, to be working uh, deliberately ahead to, uh, to be ready to respond if, if, if the occasion arises. So, so that's kind of where we are with our work. Of course, there are some very complicated aspects of this. Um, I, I'd like to touch maybe on a couple of them. Um, uh, very briefly, and one of them is, is what, what a, a central bank digital currency would do to the banking system. Um, obviously, uh, what we envisage is something that is, um, uh, is, you know, envisage is something that would not be directly competing with bank deposits. It would be something that would be more in the nature of uh, uh, performing the functions of cash uh, in, in a context where cash is, is becoming less widely used. But of course, uh, um, one can't guarantee that the outcome would be exactly what we would plan, and so we're we're, we're sort of thinking about how to how, how a product could be designed so that it doesn't sort of in, in a sense uh, disintermediate uh, the, the banking system to an excessive degree. And in particular, I think there's the whole question of uh, you know if if there were a um, you know loss of confidence in the banking system, then uh, then would uh, would the availability of a digital currency make it a lot easier for for a, a digital retail bank run to take place? Um, I mean, our preliminary response to that is, well, actually, you should work more on the fundamentals of the banking system to make sure that uh, that 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 uh, confidence is maintained. And then, in fact, uh, for for the public, there is one of the solid underpinnings of confidence in the banking system is precisely the knowledge that I have money in the bank, and if I if I want to, I can get crisp banknotes in exchange for that. And and those have the, well, in this country, the Federal Reserve, in, in Canada, the Bank of Canada, standing uh, behind them. And so that degree of confidence in the banking system, in our view, is quite an important rationale for, for thinking about this at, at all. Um, I guess another uh, aspect maybe to touch on briefly is the, uh, is the whole privacy issue. And I mentioned that privacy is certainly a legitimate uh, reason for people to um, uh, to, to prefer to use cash for certain things. I mean, if I give money to a panhandler on the street, I don't want to give away all my banking information necessarily. Um, uh, there, there, are no, there are a number of contexts in which, uh, in which actually privacy is good. And, and this is particularly true, I think, now that we've had some high-profile data breaches um, where uh, uh, you know, financial institutions have been careless with, uh, with information. And so for many members of the public, maybe they do prefer to, to, to at least to carry out some of their transactions in cash where there's no, there's no record to get lost. And so that's, um, that's, uh, that's a legitimate. Of course, there's also the whole dark side of privacy. Privacy, which is the, uh, which is money laundering, terrorist financing, tax evasion, and all that. And so, it's it's actually, I mean, in our view, it's it's kind of unthinkable that w that a central bank would be allowed to. Um, uh, design a product that would become the ideal and perfectly uh, scalable means for doing all those things. So clearly, if we ever 
uh, did issue a digital currency would have to have some 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 safeguards the way we have with you know uh, uh, you know people who go into the bank and ask for for a hundred thousand uh, dollars in 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 hundreds you know it's sort of uh, um, I mean there there has to be some degree of of uh, you know ability for law enforcement to uh, to uh, investigate some of these things uh, with a proper warrant and uh, and and some uh, uh, in some way that very large transactions get uh, get flagged but of course that involves issues of the governance and it also involves uh, making sure the technology is capable of doing that and and sort of how you marry um, a degree of privacy which actually makes this acceptable to the public versus a um, degree of of sort of safeguards against illicit use, I think, is something we'll have to th be working on more, uh, more, more deliberately and, and in a more concrete way. So, anyway, um, as I said at the outset, a really exciting area, and uh, and uh, we've got a lot, a lot of work to do. We've got a team working on this at the Bank of Canada, and certainly quite a number of other central banks are also working on the same topic. And uh, I mean, I, I think I mentioned Sweden. I think the Riks Bank has had quite a uh, large public discussion of this, and and uh, but this is this this uh, work on central bank digital currency goes alongside of uh, you know just uh, uh, trying to get a better understanding of how the world is evolving and and the various private products that are being issued, and many of which I think will actually uh, make important and uh, and 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 useful innovations in 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 the way that uh, that, that we do our business, and that's uh, uh, and that's uh, that's very exciting. So with that, uh, um, I'll. Uh, uh, leave it to the other panelists. Thank you very much. So we'll start off with Professor Garrett. Uh, thank, is this on? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so let's see. So I think, uh, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to join this, this wonderful panel. Um, I will, I, the, I think the particular aspect of Tim's comments that I'll elaborate on, as Tim said, we work together for the last year or so, so a, a lot of our thinking is, I think, aligned. <clears throat> I think I'll elaborate a little bit on some of the privacy issues because I've done some specific work on that. But before I do, I wanted to give my own sort of reset of this, of this topic. And when I think about this issue of, of whether or not central banks should, should issue CBDC, central bank digital currency, and how they should do this in relation to private initiatives, and I've worked on this, this, this area for quite a while, uh, I think in terms of two issues. First of all, what's the mandate of the central bank? And has that mandate changed? You know, have, have, have new developments in, in, in money, new developments in the payment landscape uh, changed that mandate? And so when I think about in, in, maybe in the US context, uh, the Federal Reserve was founded in 1913 basically to safeguard banks uh, uh, in the event of panics, uh, basically the lender of last resort function. And those activities since expanded uh, to include uh, uh, smooth operation of, of the banking system, of the economic system. But essentially, Fed, the central bank was founded to be the bank of the banks. And so uh, under that role, there's this question as to how far its, its responsibilities I extend. Uh, one of the things that banks, uh, our central banks, are certainly responsible for are payments. And, but in terms of that responsibility, there was a white paper that the Fed put out in 1990, which, which dictated that essentially there the responsibility regards to safety, efficiency, and, and, and access. And in fulfilling that mandate, uh, the central bank can do, play different roles. It can be the operator, or it can be the supervisor and the regulator. And so when we think again about, when I think about central bank digital currency initiatives, I, I, I frame that in terms of should we be the, the operator, or should we be the supervisor slash regulator? And another way to think about that is should we play a, a primary role or, or should we play a supportive role? And then if we think in terms of a supportive role, I think in terms of who should we be supporting? And this is where I get to this idea of changes in the payment landscape. So there was a, a very excellent paper by um, uh, uh, Bruno Meyer, James, and Landau uh, that talks about this idea of digital currencies, but it talks about this idea of this inversion of the industrial organization of the financial system. And it's getting at this idea, at least in the context of payments, uh, are banks still playing the same role, or has this role been replaced by essentially the big, the big techs? So essentially what we're thinking about here is that there's been this decoupling of the three functions of money, store of value, unit account, and medium of exchange, and that what a lot of these uh, platform providers are doing 
uh, uh, are they are picking up on the medium of exchange function, which, which I think is kind of interesting because it still preserves uh, important functions of central bank activity, which is maintaining the unit of account, uh, the store of value function through the integrity of the, of the central bank operations and the, and, the, and the faith that this instills in the system and in the, in the underlying monetary unit. But they're able to uh, leverage this to create services in the, in the function of the medium of exchange. And so if we look at the landscape now, we see that the players in that space are quite different. Uh, the Libra proposal would be an example of this. In fact, these things are integrated highly with social media platforms and others. And if this is the future, then I actually wonder whether or not we even can, <laughs> central banks can play a role in this market because we're just not in that business. Uh, so I think that that raises some questions, both in terms of what we, sh we should do, uh, what, what, uh, what, what can we do, uh, and um, I think that, that uh, ultimately we have to see how that plays out. But I, I tend to lean a lot towards the idea that, that the closest thing to the mandate, which hasn't really changed with the change of the landscape, it's just that how we implement that mandate has changed, is that I tend to think that perhaps we should be primarily thinking in terms of a, of a supportive role. Having said that, I'll tie this back to privacy. And this is the, one of the last issues that, that, that uh, Tim brought up. Now, privacy is a difficult one. So uh, Christine Lagarde, when she was still the head of the IMF, made this interesting comment. She said that when it comes to providing central bank digital currency, the central banks can do one thing the private, private sector cannot, and that's provide privacy. Now, of course, what she means is that, I mean, not privacy from the central bank, but who would want that? Uh, it's, 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 it's privacy from commercial enterprises. And I think the, the, the best way to, not, or to phrase that is that central banks don't have a, a profit incentive to do anything with your data. So the central bank can protect your data. And then the question becomes, well, why does the central bank need to do that? So as economists, when we think about intervention of any type, central bank intervention, government intervention, uh, I come back to the issue, well, there has to be some sort of market failure. And so uh, people can take actions to protect their privacy. So why isn't, why isn't there just a, not, a natural market outcome where people adequately protect their privacy? Uh, and so one of the work, pieces of work that I did while I was at the Bank of Canada with, with uh, uh, Martin Van Oort was we thought about this problem and we recognized that there's an externality. Uh, the way data works and the way big data analysis works is that they can figure out a lot of things from data. And one of the things that they can do is they can figure out similarities between you and me. Uh, and so if I'm making a purchase and I just share, decide to share my private data, uh, that may give the firm some advantage, say, in terms of price discriminating against me in the future, but it also uh, gives that firm an advantage uh, 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 in price discriminating against you because that firm can use big data analysis to figure out similarities between us. So the idea is that I don't bear the full cost, the full social cost of failing to protect my data. So there's a market failure there, and that's a, uh, that's a potential reason why, why uh, the government slash might want to be involved in uh, uh, providing an option for preserving uh, privacy. Interestingly, we can think about this uh, by, by flipping around, and we can imagine the idea that privacy uh, is uh, when data, when firms collect privacy, they're doing so not for, for evil, <laughs> to price discriminate, but they're doing it for good. Uh, that is, that with this data, they can uh, uh, do analysis, uh, figure out what consumers want, and provide goods that are more suited, suited to their needs. And so uh, on this front, I've been doing work with, with Michael Lee from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And what we point out in this context is that that sounds good and that's true. But again, there's a potential problem here, which is that uh, the, the collection of data typically allows firms to produce the best products, but it also leads to market concentration. And so we get large firms that have market power. So the idea that I'm uh, concerned about here is that the firms can use the data to make better products. These better products generate surplus, but the firms get all the surplus. So one of the things that a central bank digital currency can do is essentially give consumers a threat point that allows them to capture some of the, that surplus, essentially monetize their own data. And interestingly, this central bank currency doesn't even have to be used that much just to provide the threat point, much in the, much in the same way that the overnight reverse repo uh, uh, provides a threat point in the federal funds market. Uh, it doesn't have to be fully utilized in order for it to have an influence on, uh, on the rates that, that, uh, that lenders can demand from borrowers. So I think those are my two, two statements uh, uh, with regard to privacy. And I'll, at that point, I'll, I'll hand over to another one of the panel members. Uh, next, we have Professor Park. 
Well, thank you, and thank you for having with me on this panel. Um, so, um, my view is this: is I'm of, of course very pleased to hear that uh, uh, that the Bank of Canada is now at the contingency planning stage um, and no longer at the we'll see, let's see what happens to the world type of stage. Um, I wish we were a little longer and further along with this. Um, and the reason why I think we should be further along is there's, there is more to it than, uh, I think we have to have a little bit of a forward-looking perspective on this one. And um, so we had yesterday Martin from the Peterson Institute um, basically finished his panel with saying, you know, look, China is here, we, uh, WeChat is coming, and it's coming for you, so you better prepare. Uh, and, um, you know, without having a dystopian view, I think you'd have to take a bigger picture view here. And this is, there are a lot of opportunities in the digital economy and they require modern digital payment mechanisms. And, and digital money is one form of that that is absolutely critical for it. I mean, one of the things of the, of the internet that made it, you know, difficult to have commerce is you need to actually go through a third party provider, you need to go through credit card companies and so on and so forth. And that makes it expensive. So uh, payments alone, as a, as a payment system in, in Canada, I can say, uh, accounts for about uh, $16 billion a year. This is not a lot for the US, I understand, but it's quite a lot for Canadians. Um, for payments, you know, just digital payments that you have currently, you pay 2 to 3%. I think Square, who was here yesterday, they, they charge something like 2.6% for each transaction. That is a lot of money. Imagine you would go out, the US government goes out and, and adds a VAT, so value-added tax, to every service of 2.6%. People would be out on the street protesting it. Right? So this is enormous tax. This is a huge friction that we have on the system. And, you know, this does not allow a lot of digital forms of commerce that would otherwise be possible. Say, Internet of Things. You want to have micropayments on the amount less than a cent for transactions. That's not possible, I think, with the current system. Now, why is this important? If for, for the uh, competitive standing of an economy like Canada or the US, uh, we are exporters of financial services, both, of, both countries as I understand it, and exporters of services. If China, which wants to build a digital currency, a central bank digital currency, is getting faster with this and better with this, and India is getting faster and better with this, and India is already far, far ahead on that one too, then at some point they will develop the services that, that currently are provided and, and initiated and ideated here in Canada and, well, not here in Canada, but in the US and in Canada. So what I'm saying with this is on the one area where we have a huge competitive advantage, we may fall behind. And I think this is a huge threat point. And I think this is where I would like to see that, that central banks actually take a more proactive role. And, and proactive not in the sense of you don't have to develop the, you know, the, the, your own network where everything works. I know that this is kind of the thinking that we have. What I would like to see is that central banks, like the Fed or the Bank of Canada, actually become creative and say, look, say, take blockchains as they are. I, we know they're clunky. We know they don't have the ability to just have the transaction rate that we need in order to have, uh, you know, to, to service even the payment system. It's not possible simply with the technology that exists. But issue some money there, and you can do that. We can do this right now, right? I can take my laptop out and we can issue a billion dollars on that one. And then let's see where this goes. Let's see what business opportunities people, you know, envision and what they develop with this. And just take a risk there and, you know, just see where, what you can, what people are coming up with and what is being developed. So you, what I'm trying to say here with this is you, you just can't cover every angle and, and be absolutely secure that your digital money is not used by criminals and so on. I mean, cash is used by criminals too, right? And we still issue cash. So just take the risk and, you know, do some small experiments. And I don't mean experiments with the banks. I actually mean experiments with where real people can do the real things and see what happens. Because we cannot envision everything that people cannot come up yet. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll try and be brief so we can get to the discussion. Um, and I'm gonna pick up on what Andreas was saying. I come at this as a technology scholar more than uh, as someone whose roots are in uh, banking and financial regulation. Um, so, uh, you know, I think Rod is absolutely right to say that central banks need to start from what their mandate is, but if we can abstract back from that um, to think from a, a public policy perspective, um, what should the mandates be? Um, you know, I think it's instructive to say, uh, hypothetically, uh, what if um, we were all Alexander Hamilton now, that central banking didn't exist 
um, in its current form, um, how would we create it today? Um, would we create a system today that is not fully digital, uh, that involves using these uh, paper banknotes um, and all the uh, existing kinds of payment intermediaries that we have and so forth? Uh, and I'm hard pressed to think about why we would. Um, I mean, certainly we can talk about uh, the value proposition of um, the banknotes and so forth, but, but all of that sounds a lot like the argument that I heard um, back in the early days of the internet when I was doing internet policy uh, at the Federal Communications Commission. Well, Amazon.com is not going to take off. Why, why would you buy a book online and forfeit the opportunity to go into a bookstore and flip through the pages and browse around and so forth. And that was all true. I mean, there's an experience that you could get going into a bookstore that you don't get online. But as we all know, even though the physical bookstores haven't gone away, um, the, the digital experience is so much better and more convenient and, and more valuable in terms of what the provider can do with the data um, that it has taken off. And not just in books, of course, in all these other areas. So, it seems to me um, fairly obvious that at some point in time, um, money is going to be digital. And that, that point is not necessarily that far off. Um, and then the question is, um, what's the role of public authorities? Um, and it seems, again, fairly obvious that there is a public good value in money, um, in having some sort of um, financial primitive um, of uh, something equivalent to a fiat currency that's then a foundation for private activity on top. Um, and so, therefore, there still has to be a role for central banks. Um, there's value in terms of what, uh, what Tim and the other um, panelists have talked about um, in central banks exercising that role. Um, but then we have to start with the assumption that we need to move forward with some kind of system um, that digitizes. And I think that forces us to look at this series of practical questions and figure out how to address them. So we've heard some discussion already in the panel about privacy. Um, and there is um, a, a clearly important challenge in providing for the privacy value and the anonymity value that cash provides, um, while at the same time providing for protection against financial crime and money laundering and so forth. Um, and this is um, not a, a fundamental paradox. This is a technical problem. Um, and while I would agree with you know, everyone that's on the panel and probably most of you, you know, at a conference like this, um, Bitcoin is not going to suddenly take over and be um, the money that, that crowds out everything. When we talk about blockchain and cryptocurrencies, it's a spectrum of different technologies. It's a family of technologies. And there's a great deal of work going on with modern cryptography, um, with zero knowledge proofs and multi-party computation systems to create systems, for example, that can be um, anonymous, um, but only to a degree. So if, if my query is, does someone have $200,000 in liquid assets? Um, to you know, be the basis for a loan. I can answer that query without getting access to all their financial records. Um, and you know, these systems are emergent, and there are all sorts of practical questions, um, but it's a, it's a tractable problem if we sit down and try to address it. So I, I would agree with, with um, what Andreas was saying as well. We need to start doing experiments. Similarly, financial inclusion. Um, one of the, the interesting value propositions of something like Libra is to provide access to the financial system to those who don't have bank accounts. Um, that's something that could conceivably be a feature of a system if the central bank is involved um, to provide um, some additional financial access. Now, maybe that's not a central bank itself providing an account-based system. Maybe there's, there's some sort of new kind of public option, narrow bank entity that's added into the system. But again, once we start with the question of how do we design a system and spec it out to solve that problem, then possibilities open up. And the final one I'll, I'll mention briefly is the cross-border issue. Obviously, one of the, the limitations of any fiat currency is it's issued by a sovereign state. So um, that creates two kinds of issues. One is um, the issue um, that uh, Mark Carney talked about in his Jackson Hole speech that probably you're familiar with um, in terms of the dominant power of the US dollar. Uh, but another one is the issue for any kind of cross-border transaction where there's so much delay and expense going through the correspondent banking system. Um, we can think of it, we start to think about a world where central banks are by default creating digital currency how to create systems, maybe they are Libra-like systems that have a basket of assets, like a, a super 
uh, special drawing rights system, maybe there's something else. Uh, but again, that becomes a defined problem where we can start to drill down on what are the technical means of solving it. So, you know, it's certainly right, uh, and you know, and the Bank of Canada deserves a lot of credit for being really early on to see and to start to analyze this problem. But I think we're far enough along now that um, while it's, it's appropriate to say um, this is not a cause for panic, this is not going to happen overnight, if we can agree that this is the end point, uh, then we really need to start drilling down on what are the questions that need to be answered. Um, and then what are the practical mechanisms of answering them? And, and again, there's a lot of technology out there and a lot of uh, real world experimentation that's happening with cryptocurrencies um, and with uh, mobile money systems like they have in China that, that I think we're farther along in be able, being able to answer some of those questions than we may think we are. start to the conversation, and um, what I think is interesting is um, you go across the panel today and we have at least a willingness to do contingency planning. We have at least two people who are saying we need to start running experiments. Um, we have, I think, everybody who would say we probably want to be supportive of experiments even if the central bank is not the one doing the, the experiments, and I'm not sure we would have said that two years ago. So um, that said, um, I'd like to try to pin the panel down a little more precisely on um, whether those experiments should be conducted by the central bank, whether they should be done by private entities, and, and whether we view a central bank digital currency as a complement or a substitute to what might develop in the private market. So anyone can jump in on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, okay, uh, yeah, uh, I, I think it, it, it's clearly going to require both. I mean, uh, and, and there's all, you know, there's already a lot of work going on uh, in, in uh, as Andreas said, in the private sector, uh, uh, you know, experimenting with different products. You know, we've done some proofs of concept ourselves, including, uh, you know, some work on, on uh, more of a wholesale a digital currency, the uh, you know using uh, using uh, tokens to to do uh, large value transfers, to do security settlement, to do cross border transfers, but also uh, but all, we've also done some sort of smaller uh, experiments with uh, with particular forms of uh, you know digital currency that you know private sector providers have been developing, and so we're I, I mean I, I would say that uh, that uh, as we're working ahead on this, we're certainly going to increasingly. Uh, be relying on collaboration with the private sector because uh, you know a lot of the uh, a lot of the expertise and the uh, the imagination is really out there. Uh, I mean, central banks are, I think, are institutions that put a lot of value in 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 uh, being trusted in uh, in not doing things that are too wild in sticking to their mandate. You know, even to the extent that we are. We, we are moving forward on this. We're grounding it very solidly in our mandate, but at the same time, we need to complement that with a private sector uh, sense of, of being willing to try things that may not work, and uh, and and, uh, and 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 just to to get a sense of, of the range of things that are out there. So, um, so again, I, I like to hear this. this. I like the sound of all of this. Um, what I would like to see is the following. Um, and, I th and here's also the reason why I think the central banks could have a very important role. Because it is a signal when you go out and say, look, here's a, here's a little bit of toy money, play with it and see what you can do with it. So, um, I mean, just, just uh, you know, blue sky thinking. Go out and take, go to Ethereum and issue, say, $100 million on Ethereum as a token. You can do that. It's, you know, you can put some limits on it. You can, you can try to find technological solutions so that you make sure that there's some form of KYC there. But I think it's technologically possible. Um, at least that's what I, as I understand how it works. And then, you know, basically send it out and say, look, people now develop products on this and show us that you can actually put it to good use. Um, you can do this then with whatever, pick a few other, say, uh, technologies where you do the same thing. This is, I would say, really low risk because it costs you nothing to do. I mean, it costs you a little bit of development and possibly a little bit of a... Of a, of a potential backlash if thing go, things go wrong, but it could also give you a lot of praise if things go right, and you can show how you are one of the innovative countries and innovative uh, initiatives that you could have. 
And uh, so try to find a, a simple solution, uh, not at the biggest possible scale, and don't leave it to entirely to, say, stablecoin providers. Because there's a lot in that space which I find is a lot of voodoo economics um, and that, I'm, that I am actually significantly concerned about. And I think when, when you go in, and so also, you know, apart from the fact that you could work with small providers, um, you can also send a signal to, say, large banks that the world is changing and that they have to prepare. So just in case you don't know, in Canada we have a lo long debate about open banking, and I think the way I understand it is our banks would really like this to die. Um, um, but um, you know, but they wouldn't say it out loud. Uh, so I think this is a very that you can send strong signals saying you guys have to innovate and prepare for the future. But just just a note on open banking. I mean the. The government is actually, move, you know, after the consultation process, is actually moving ahead. Although they, they're deciding not to call it open banking because it, that has the, the connotation of anybody can have your data, whereas it's, I think it's going to be called customer-directed banking, meaning that you get to control, the customer gets to control the use of the data. So, so I think that's a really good way to phrase it, this idea of thinking about complements or substitutes. And one, one thing that uh, it makes me think of is that if, if the central bank was to provide a substitute, issue a central bank digital currency, that would require a change in the Bank Act. And so just that alone tells you that this is something that has to be thought at sort of a fundamental level, and I think it's been mentioned in, in Sweden and also I think in, in Canada that this isn't just a central bank decision, this would be a government, a government decision. Um, but I, 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 I've been leaning more recently towards the substitute role uh, in the sense that I'm not sure we, we can uh, provide, uh, 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 sorry, a co the complementary role, because I'm not sure we can provide a substitute. Again, if I think in terms of the developments in the payment space and how payments is being so deeply integrated into other aspects of social media platforms and so on, uh, I'm, I'm not sure we can compete with this. It's not our, it's not our business model, just like being a bank to every individual uh, in the country is not necessarily uh, our business model. And so I think that uh, in some ways, uh, uh, I won't steal any of Gary's thunder, but, but thinking about what's going on in, in, in China, um, you know, the central bank there is, 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 is basically trying to provide uh, the liquidity that undermines, or not undermines, <laughs> that's the, the opposite of what I was trying to say, uh, that's, that supports payments in the Alipay system. And so these are the types of activities that maybe, maybe uh, central banks are best suited for. Yeah, the, the private sector is not going to wait. So um, the, it's going to continue developing. I mean, Facebook, you know, again, Gary's going to talk about uh, Libra, but uh, there's Libra, and then Facebook just announced uh, another system, Facebook Pay. Um, and if you think that uh, a company like Amazon um, is not very actively, aggressively working on something in the digital payment space and a company like Google and so forth, um, then you're deluding yourselves. There, there, there clearly is going to be more private sector activity whether the central banks are engaged in the process or not. So again, I, I come back to what I said before. The question becomes what are the, the policy criteria? Um, what are the, um, the, the goals that, and the limits that need to be set? Um, there's experimentation, but there's also a role for, for definition, um, for saying that you know, if there is a system, here are our attributes that it needs to have. Um, and then, yeah, there still is an irreducible uh, need in terms of being a baseline provider of trust that no private entity can fulfill. Um, there's still that value of central banks. That's the piece that doesn't go away when the system becomes digital. Uh, so it's about piecing out um, how to preserve that role, and then what are the pieces that, that really are complementary, um, and providing some guidance to the private sector um, so that the private sector systems uh, are not these you know, purely voodoo kinds of systems. We're seeing that happen in the blockchain world, in the cryptocurrency world, for example, where the, the most popular stablecoin is something called Tether, um, which is an incredibly... Um, uh, scammy seeming kind of solution. It's, it's not at all clear um, that it is legitimate at all, and yet it's being adopted widely in the cryptocurrency ecosystem because it's there and it works uh, for what people need. Uh, I don't want to see that become um, the dominant kinds of system as that market expands, um, but that's only going to happen um, if there's not um, a legitimate public sector alternative. Okay, we have a few minutes left for this panel, so I will uh, take uh, one question anyway. Sure. Uh, 
Hi, good morning. This has been a fantastic conversation. I'm Chris Calabria from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and we're interested in this topic because of the issue that the Professor Werbach mentioned, which is might the digital currencies be more inclusive? If you know the answer to that, please spare us a lot of research money uh, and time. <laughs> uh, but I do want to ask as well um, a, a question. So might the answer to the question of the title of this event be, actually, it's going to be a mix of both private and central bank digital currency. So uh, Deputy Governor Lane, you mentioned, for example, that paper banknotes benefit from the backing of a central bank. If you look at the history of paper money, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority issues its notes through three commercial banks. The Scottish bank note is issued under contract through Scott, three Scottish banks. Might that be the future of digital currency? Yeah, certainly it might. I mean, the, uh, uh, I think there are a number of ways this could play out and sort of what the respective roles of the private and public sectors, I think, uh, uh, you know, is an important part of working on uh, we're working on this, and and sort of I think I think related to that, and, and also you know drawing in this conversation, the sense of well, what what is the public sector involvement actually bringing to this? Uh, you know, what 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 are the sort of the bedrock elements that have to be provided by a public institution, and 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 what uh, uh, and, and and what are the areas where the private sector can usefully. Uh, uh, innovate and uh, and sort of build on what the, uh, on the foundations that the public sector is providing. So that was pretty quick. We can do one more question. <laughs> yes, over there. Thank you. Diego Zuluaga from the Cato Institute. My question is on trust and scale. Um, I'm a big fan of Canada. I lived in Montreal for four years, but it's a country of 35 million people where 99% of people have bank accounts. If we're looking to expand financial inclusion and increase trust in the system, isn't it private institutions operating in countries with bad public institutions that can provide both the trust and the scale that is lacking? Thank you. Yeah, I, mean, I guess uh, certainly it's true that the um, that the appeal of some of these uh, uh, digital currencies is greater in countries that don't have a well-functioning existing system. And uh, I mean, I think the fact that uh, well, and, and a couple of examples, you know, countries uh, uh, when you look at the fact that uh, uh, there's been such uh, uh, amazing progress in uh, digital payments media in China, where uh, in a sense, they're leapfrogging uh, uh, a banking system that is, uh, is is not providing for a lot of the basic needs of the public. It's less clear that there's a, you know, that there's a, a strong uh, motivation for adopting some of these things in countries that already have well-functioning systems. And in a sense, um, that's also part of the reason that we're not seeing uh, a digital currency as being something that. Um, we're not seeing the case being very strong based on the status quo, but rather we're thinking about the future and how, how the system could evolve with technology and therefore what role we would have to play in that context. So I'm going to just very briefly chime in on this one. Uh, so we ran a survey uh, regarding Libra, um, and we ran it in the U.S., and we also ran it in uh, Nigeria. And uh, the responses in Nigeria were very, very clear that there was a huge appetite for using this kind of uh, private initiative money. And the appetite in the US was significantly lower um, for whatever reason. Uh, now, I don't want to you know, um, dump on uh, Facebook on this one. But uh, having said that, whenever we asked, we asked two questions, we asked them whether or not they would like Facebook money. Or, and half of the population, we asked if they want technology company issued money. And uh, the propensity to accept money was, from Facebook was about 20 percentage points lower than uh, from non-Facebook. So. Which, which comes down to trust again, and is trust in Facebook. And, and certainly, uh, yeah, absolutely, on a relative basis, the, the states that do not have um, good, well-functioning rule of law and trust, that's where there's more of an opportunity for these systems as substitutes. Um, but on an absolute basis, you look at any of the studies of levels of trust in government and trust in the financial system and trust in the banks, including in countries like this one, um, it's far, far below what it used to be and trending downward. So again, going forward, this is you know, a reason to, you know, to think that certainly there's a difference, um, but that's not, that trust problem is not just something we think, think about happening in uh, non-functioning states. So I would like to keep the panelists here for another four hours, but the clock has run out. Let's, let's uh, uh, thank these folks, and then we can continue the conversation.